Good morning, class. How is everyone? Good to see you. We will begin in the book of Acts again this morning as we're venturing through this book to see what the Holy Spirit is saying to us today. We do welcome you and welcome those that are watching online this morning. Pray that this will be a blessing and an understanding and the goal of this class is to jump start us uh, even for the next service. We are here to learn and to see what the Holy Spirit says. But it, um, it has uh, the condition of this class and this time I think has a large bearing on the next session also of the power of the Spirit, the presence of the Spirit. And for us that are sitting in here, <clears throat> to be in touch with the Holy Spirit. So as we begin this teaching uh, this week, this will be Lesson 10, and then we're still in Chapter 2. If you'd like to follow along in your Bibles, we're in Chapter 2, but I'll have the Scripture also uh, up here for us to see. Now, I've been discussing uh, last week, and I will also this week, uh, baptism of the Spirit, being filled with the Spirit, and um, there is, I watched a big debate this past week that uh, <clears throat> the debate, then the debate was uh, uh, two Calvinists uh, th come from a Calvinistic viewpoint and those that are what we call word and spirit, which would be more of the crowd that, that we're in, we actually believe that God still speaks. And uh, uh, most of Christianity does not believe that. So just for, so you'll know, you're, uh, you're already in a minority to start with. And, uh, uh, but there are, uh, that's the reason with Catholicism, uh, you had to have a priest or a pope to tell you what God really means. And so as I'm standing in front of you, I, my goal is not to so much teach you anything as it is to raise enough questions that you could look at the Word of God, be as a Berean, the Bible says, study to see if those things that are being said are true or not. And I want to show today how I can stand before you or you can stand before anybody yourself and you can stand in your own power or you can stand in the power of the Holy Spirit. There is a difference. There is a difference. And I want us to look at it biblically this week on how there is a difference in being uh, empowered with the Spirit or just empowered by the human spirit. So we're going to look at that this week as we talk about and speak about the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit. So as we begin, and we'll kind of pick up here just a little bit of last week, not much, but I have to just a little to, because I stopped in an open thought uh, actually last week. And we were talking about the baptism of the Spirit, and there's two terms we're using, baptism and filling of the Spirit. Um, the, um, a lot of times we like things just to be really cut and dried. But in the book of Acts, that doesn't happen. The book of Acts, the reason I say we call it a transitional book, and in, a, uh, in other words, the Holy Spirit, there were some that were uh, filled with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Some were filled with the Holy Spirit with the laying on of hands. Some have never, had never heard of the Spirit. And so you've got different scenarios there about the topic of the Holy Spirit. And so we're looking for definite terms, <coughs> excuse me, terminology of baptism. Of, and I, I tend to, um, <coughs> excuse me, I tend to group it 
I say group, but that's not a good word. I guess it is if you're croupy. Uh, most, uh, you have scripture, just of course there again, it's uh, scripture is given unto the interpretation of the translations that we have. Uh, but most of the time when you see baptism of the Spirit, most of the time it's speaking about being placed into the body of Christ. Um, there's a, there's some places it says being baptized in the Spirit. And um, but for the most part, that type baptism, and there again, there's different types of baptism, and they all use the same word baptism, which gets it a little bit complicated. But there is what we call being baptized into the body of Christ, which I covered some last week. Uh, and that's an operation of the Holy Spirit. It's not an operation of me. It's an operation of God, if you will. And He places us in the body. He baptizes you into to the body. So I'm wanting to introduce you to that distinction last week of that term baptized, being placed, or being immersed into. And uh, we'll get into that just a little more today of the baptism of the Spirit. And I'll be on the baptism of the Spirit for quite a few weeks as we give the different examples. That's the reason when people jump up and down saying, well, you've got to have this baptism and speak in tongues as proof of the baptism. That's going to leave out a lot of people in the book of Acts that got a baptism but didn't do tongues. So you, you've got to understand it's um, God tends to, uh, when it comes to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is a person. And the Holy Spirit doesn't have a rule book that He goes by when He imparts what He imparts. He, he, he's a person of God. And that person of God, if he wants to baptize somebody by the laying on of hands, guess what? That's the, what's what he's choosing. And, 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 what you, and the part we're wanting to catch here is <clears throat> when they were instructed to lay hands on for the baptism of the Spirit, the key word there is not baptism of the Spirit. The key word there is they heard the Spirit say, lay hands on. Are, are you with me? And so it's about following the Spirit. It's not about which procedure did they use, right? And so as we enter into the book of Acts, we start seeing that the Holy Spirit is released in Acts 2, and guess what? The Holy Spirit starts speaking, messes up theology, messes up Bible, right? If you're going to follow it and say, well, God did it this way, this way, this way, this way, well, when God released His Holy Spirit, guess what? He released His Spirit. And God will do whatever He wants to, how He wants to do it. And He does just enough difference so we can't make a doctrine out of it. I know people say they won't sound doctrine, but I can give you the soundest doctrine you'll ever hear. God just does enough so you can't be too sound. And sound doctrine to us is what makes sense to us, not to God. So, and trust me, God puts just enough in Scripture. He throws just, you'll think you're down the right path, and He'll throw a log jam in your way. Just when you got your system down to this is the way God's going to do it, He throws just enough in there to where you can't really trust yourself. You got to trust His Spirit. And, and, and that's, what it's, that's what the book of Acts says is about. That's what the outpouring of the Spirit's about. And that's the reason, too, people, you know, get very upset with the expressions of the Holy Spirit. You know, some people cry, some people weep, some people don't do anything, they just sit there in total peace. I've seen people shake and jerk and, and uh, these different, uh, we call manifestations of the Spirit. If you're in the crowd that doesn't believe that God speaks today, they say that you're full of a demon. It's a little bit difference of opinion, I would say. Uh, difference of opinion. So it, it would... Um, but you can see, if you don't believe God speaks today, how that would have to be your conclusion, right? If God, if God doesn't speak. And so, we, you have to, you're either one or two camps. God doesn't speak outside of His Word, or God has His Word, and He speaks outside of His Word, even though it's confirmed by His Word. That's fine. 
And we're not saying that he's writing necessarily new scripture, but there's nothing new under the sun, the Bible says. So you, if it's God, you can pretty much confirm it by his, by his word. But we're of the mindset that God speaks outside of this. He speaks to our heart. And as I was watching this big debate last week, I was wondering, well, if, if God doesn't speak outside of his word, how in the world did they, hear, did they get saved? Uh, I, that's the Holy Spirit convicting a heart, is it not? Well, if, if he doesn't speak outside, of, how, how can you even be convicted if the Holy Spirit doesn't speak? So, and I understand there is a line, you can carry that too far. I don't know that you can carry it too far. You can, you can carry it into error, but the, you, can, you can say that the Holy Spirit's speaking and it's not the Holy Spirit, you know. But most of the time, the Holy Spirit speaks to us in service. So let's look at it, the baptism again a little more. Now this baptism of the Spirit also was told by Jesus in Acts 1, 5. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost uh, not many days uh, hence. Now I'm going to show you some verses where it says here that they'll be baptized not many days hence. And we know that's in Acts 2, right? The day of Pentecost and the outpouring of the Spirit. But I'm going to show you some verses here in a minute that I hope aggravate you to think a little bit. It says you'll be baptized with the Holy Ghost uh, not many days. Baptism of the Spirit is still going on even today. It's been going on ever since. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether you be Jews or Gentiles. See that? Whether we be bond or free and have all have been all made to drink of, of one spirit. So we're all drinking of the same spirit, but you can see you're baptized or placed into uh, the body of Christ. <clears throat> so that's a that's a one baptism, but that's an operation of the of the spirit. Now the Holy Spirit is revealed as a divine person in John 14, and I pray the Father, he shall give you another comforter, this is Jesus, and he may abide with you for how long? For how long? Forever. Now watch this. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, <coughs> excuse me, but you know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be what? So now we start getting this information from Jesus. You start getting this enlightenment that, that he's going to be in you. Well, this is new to these guys. But they're getting, getting introduced, if you will, to this thought or this concept of the Holy Spirit's going to be in you. He says He's going to dwell uh, with you. Now in Luke He says, If you then, being evil, uh, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? So we can see that this is a gift uh, from the Holy Spirit, but I also wanted to point out uh, to them that ask Him. You see that? So, so there's a part of the Spirit that we need to ask Him for. Can you see that? There's part of the Spirit. Now there's part being baptized in the body. That's not an operation of us. That's an operation of God. But then there's a part of His Spirit, He says, that you need to ask Him for. So here we see a little more of a, of a distinction of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> now at the close of His ministry, Jesus promised uh, that He would Himself pray to the Father that in an answer to prayer the Comforter would come and abide. So Jesus says here that He prayed this, that the Comforter would come and the Comforter would abide. And I've made a confession to this church and even others that the Holy Spirit the rest of my life, I'm dedicated to try to learn more about the operation of the Holy Spirit, who the Holy Spirit is. I don't want somebody's opinion. I want to, I want to go to the book. I want to see what the book says. And I want to let the book say what it says. And then I just have to deal with it, I guess, is the only thing I know. Because <laughs> try, I've tried everybody else's way, and I'm not getting too far. I'm not saying it didn't work for them, but... Uh, Anyway, so y'all test what I say as I'm making this venture. Now in John 14, And I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another comforter, 
that he may abide with you forever, there he says. Now, on the evening of his resurrection, he came to the disciples. Now, this is interesting. This is pre-Acts, not but 12, 15 days probably. But right before, uh, on the uh, evening, evening of his resurrection, no, that's, that's more days than that. On the evening of his resurrection, he came to the disciples. Now, watch this. And breathed on them, saying, Receive you the Holy Ghost. Well, I thought the Holy Spirit didn't come to Lax too. So confusing. Here we, I got a feeling if Jesus breathed on you to receive it, you got it. But, so, it looks like I got a little bit of a contradiction in Jesus' uh, resurrection power. He breathed on the disciples and he said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Well, <clears throat> one thing we want to understand in the Old Testament, all the way up into Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, we see that the Holy Spirit would go and come. Would go and come. Right here, I don't have the assurance that He's not leaving, even though Jesus started to say, He's going to abide with you forever. Right? So you start getting this language. And why did He say forever? Because previously the Holy Spirit go and come. So then He drops His on you. It's going to be forever. Not only that, it's going to be in you. So if He's in you forever... It's beyond me how you can lose your salvation. Amen. Just a side note. Now, <clears throat> now in John 20, verse 22, And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. So Jesus breathed on them to receive the Holy Ghost before Acts 2 when the Holy Ghost was poured out. Just a thought. But I want you to catch the thought. I want you to test it, and let's carry it on through. This indicates you can receive the Holy Ghost, but not the power of the Holy Ghost. Now, it just so happens, Acts 2, the outpouring of the Spirit, was the outpouring of the power of the Holy Ghost. Are you with me? So it's possible to receive the Holy Spirit, but not receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Can you see that? Now, as Christians, I want to receive it, but between me and you, I'd love to have the power of it. Amen. So let's keep that thought in mind as we progress here now. The power comes upon you when you carry out being a witness. <clears throat> the power comes to activate you to be a witness. In other words, the disciples received the Holy Spirit, but they had not been empowered or it had not been given the power or activated yet. What activated it? I'm going to show you the Scripture here. What activated the power of the Holy Spirit that had been breathed into them was when they walked in the position of being a witness. Now the power comes upon you. The Spirit is in you. Power comes upon you. Spirit's in you. A lot of people say, well, I want, to, I want the power of the Spirit. Well, okay, go, go to Walmart and start talking to somebody. So you've got to understand, the power comes upon you. Even though you've got the, you've, even though you've got the Holy Spirit in you. Power. In other words, there's a, there's a, there's, I'm going to show you here in a minute how there is a, there's an inward witness of the Spirit, and then there's an outer witness of the Spirit. There's an inner witness, but yet there's a witness that God comes. God is, but also He comes. Now what happens is, is when you have a train wreck, of the Spirit within, with God coming, it creates this train wreck of the Spirit and creates His dunamis power. And He'll empower you to be a witness. And the power gifts will, can come upon you as you're being a witness of Jesus Christ Himself. Are you with me? A lot of people want the power gifts 
but they want to show off or they want people to think they've got something. It's not Bible. It's not Bible. Now, I want you to see this. Test what I say. <clears throat> Acts 1, 7 and 8. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons. They were asking him when he would be set up his kingdom. Which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be what? Witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Can you see that? Is that Bible or not? That's Bible. And so what it says is ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Well, they had already received the Holy Ghost because Jesus breathed it on, you, on them. I showed you that before He went up the last time in His resurrected body. He, re, he blew on them to receive the Holy Ghost. But here they get the power of the Holy Ghost and the empowerment comes so that they fulfill the commission. So as believers... If you want any hope of experiencing the power of God, it comes upon you in the transaction of being a witness. Are you with me? That's the reason somebody can give a personal testimony. And if it's a true personal testimony, 100% of the time it's empowered. It'll touch your heart. It'll get the lost saved. Just a testimony, a true testimony, not a show-off testimony, not a testimony where somebody wants to preach a sermon while they're giving it, right? The true testimony is, I once was blind, but now I see. That's what a true testimony is. Then what happens is it's empowered. It goes forth in the power of the Spirit. When people give testimony, a lot of times they won't, they think that they, they're under this idea that I got to give you enough words so I convince you what I'm saying is true. Uh, that's not what's happening. What's happening is you're given a testimony or being a witness, and there's power comes on those few words. The fewer the words, the better when, when being a, a witness. If you witness to someone in the mall or Walmart, the fewer words you use, the better. So many people try to witness and they got to give them a three-part sermon or a Sunday school lesson to give them the God. That's not the way it works. That's not even what's happening. It's done by the power of the Holy Ghost. The only thing you're engaging is being a witness. Trust me, if you'll engage being a witness when the Holy Spirit says to be a witness and you can say the gospel backwards and they will get saved. <laughs> That's right. Because it's the power of the Spirit. Amen. Power of the Spirit. And, and so how, how do I know that this is happening? Just start moving. When you, if, if, some, if something comes up to you, and I, I, I give an example, uh, you're sitting somewhere, and the Lord says, uh, go give that person 50 bucks or 100 bucks or 20 bucks. And all of a sudden, it just kind of goes up and leaves. Well, if you sit there and you try to tear that thing apart, if you should or you're not, or I need that 20 bucks Friday, I mean, you go through all this gyration of stuff. And I, and I use money just because that's the closest things to our hearts. But if you use, use that as an example, what you do is you just move on it and you give it. Well, what you, don't, what you need to consider is that 20 bucks can turn into 20,000 bucks or 2,000 bucks or 200 bucks when it's empowered by the Spirit. And one way that it does that, you gave them 20 and God's going to give you 200 back. So, well, Alan, that's not so. Well, it, I don't know what the Holy Ghost wants to do. It's, it's just true. And the reason is this power word. Um, who was it? Uh, power evangelism. Uh, John Wimber. John Wimber, he had this thing he called power evangelism. And that's what he was talking about. You just operate, you just you evangelize, but it's power evangelism. You just go, you just be a witness. You say the few words, and the Holy Ghost shows up and does the work of the Holy Spirit. If we have the idea, I've got to debate and have the 
a great argument that I, if you talk somebody into Christianity, it won't stick. It's just not going to stick. What you want to have to happen is somebody is born again. And we got into that a little last week. I won't hit it a little again today if I'll hush and move on. Okay. Has everybody got that? So as we're moving on, Jesus announced it in Acts 1, 4 through 5, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John further baptized the water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Here we see that they are going to be immersed for power. Now, born again was in John 3, 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, I hit this a little bit last week. I'm going to hit a little more, complete it hopefully this morning. It says, except man be born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So, we see here, we have to be born of the Spirit, of the water and the Spirit. All right, being indwelt by the Spirit, uh, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. There it is. Now, if any man has not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So, when the born again transaction happens, then the Spirit of God comes and dwells in you, and there's a reason why. Now, I touched this just a little at the closing last week. Adam was a direct creation of God, thus born of God, and the Scriptures refer to him as a, as a son of God. This is a very, if you want to know one of the most important things of your salvation experience that you need to understand, it's this one slide. Adam was a direct creation of God direct creation of God. Thus he was born of God. Adam had a daddy and a mama, and it was God. He was directly born of God, created by God. So therefore he was called a son of God. Angels were direct creations of God. This is why in Old Testament sometimes they're called sons of God. We are sons of Adam and not directly from God. So we're sons of Adam. <coughs> we have a fallen nature. We are not direct sons and daughters of the Most High God. We are sons and daughters of Adam. We have a uh, female, male chromosomes and all that stuff until we're born again. So when you are born again, you're born from Adam. But when you're born again, you are born of God. So that puts you as of a liking unto Adam. You are a new creation. What's the new birth talking about? What's the new creation talking about? The new birth is of necessity to be a son of God, to be a child of God. It's of necessity. That's how we get into heaven, if you will. That's how we walk with God, because we are His children. Now, has everybody got that? Now, in John 1, 11 through 13, He came directly into His own, and His own received Him not. But as many as receive Him, to them gave He power to become who? Sons of God. Not the sons of Adam, but the sons of God. Even to them that believe on His name which were born not of blood, or of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of who? <coughs> so our status changes from being born of the water, flesh. It changes because we're born of the Spirit, which makes a transaction for us. Uh, we now have uh, uh, a new Father, if you will. It's called God the Father. It changes everything, our inheritance and all that. Now it goes on to say, to them gave He power to do what? He gave them power to be the sons of God. So, you start understanding 
that not only are we sons of God now with a born again experience, but He promises us some power to go along with fulfilling being the sons of God. Do you see that? Now, the, the apostles had received the Spirit, but they had not walked in the power. Well, they had some token power as long as Jesus was here. They did raid the dead and heal the sick and stuff. But now Jesus was leaving, and He said, with me leaving, I need to leave you plugged up somehow to the power. Right? And He said, you'll have the power as you go and be a witness. Why would God want to empower us when we're sitting on the swing? In other words, the empowerment that is speaking here goes along with the call of the witness. So when you're not being a witness and you're eating or something, or uh, one of the greatest uh, uh, distractions of walking in the power of God is a cell phone. That's a whole sermon which we'll not do today. But now I'm not saying it can't be used to read Scripture and all that, but the distractions is what keeps us from walking in the power. Now, you can be at work, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit says, say this to this person. Well, if you turn to that person right then, and you respond as the Holy Ghost told you to respond, the, the power of the Holy Spirit will hit you right there. You didn't have to prepare for it. Matter of fact, the Holy Spirit will call you to move when you think you're the least prepared. Why? Because it's not about you. It's not about your preparedness. Yeah, that's right. It's about the Holy Ghost. It's about the Holy Spirit. It's about our ability to respond to the Holy Spirit. All right. To be born again means you have become a direct creation of God. So therefore you have been indwelt by the Spirit, of this operation of God. You've been sealed by the Spirit. That's operation of God, not you. And you have been baptized by the Spirit, or you've been placed into the body. That's, that's, that's all God operation. You don't have anything to do with that right there. You're indwelt, you're sealed, and you're baptized. You, can't, you, you didn't have nothing to do with it, so you can't change it. And you've got to always remember, once God does something, it's there. You, you, God, God doesn't indwell, seal, and baptize unless you're going to so somebody that's not going to stay there. But, because God would have to say, uh-oh. God doesn't say, uh-oh. He's never said it, and He's not going to start now. So, but I want you to understand these operations of the Spirit. Then there's things that's operations of us, which we ask, and I showed you the Scripture, where we can ask for more of His Spirit, and that's what we call a filling of His Spirit. And we'll get into that a little more. I did that last week too, though. Now, uh, baptism is, uh, is not a command to us. Now, it is an, those things I just read. It is an act of God whereby the believer in Jesus Christ is indwelt by the Spirit of God, sealed unto the day of redemption, and placed into the body of Christ, the church, by the baptism of the Spirit. The filling of the Spirit of God is the enablement for service. That's when we, you're filled and the power comes upon you. Uh, we are commanded to be filled with the Spirit. Ephesians 5.18, Be not drunk with wine, where is in excess, but be ye what? Filled with, and it says what? But be ye filled with the Spirit. <clears throat> so he goes on in John 14, How long will the Spirit be with you? And I pray the Father, He will shall give you another comforter, that He may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot see, because He seeth Him, neither knoweth Him, but ye know Him, for He dwells with you, and shall be in you. Now the Spirit would dwell in people and not just come on them, and His presence would be permanent and not temporary. Now there's a good place to say glory, hallelujah. You see, this is a, a temporary, this is not a temporary, this, this, this is permanent, this being uh, Christ. He says He'll abide with us uh, forever, He'll be in us. Now let's look at Acts 2.5. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven, it says. We see here in Acts 2.5, uh, all were there as it was required. 
for the Feast of Pentecost. Here we see a deeper meaning tied to Babel. Now, the day of Pentecost, we know that they all started speaking in tongues. What you got to understand is to consider the outpouring of the Spirit and speaking in tongues was a spit in the face to the curse of Babel. See that? See that? When the Holy Ghost came, <laughs> he, said, he said, watch this. Right? Got a little redneck in him, I'm sorry. <laughs> Holy Ghost got a little redneck. But, but, <laughs> but he, said, he said, watch this. So then all of a sudden we get this thing of tongues and everybody starts hearing in their own language. So it's the reverse of the curse of the Bible. Done by the operation of the Holy Spirit. Nobody thought of that one except God. The day of Pentecost was a divine moment of invading the curse of Bible. You see that? Now, th this is other tongues, and there's, uh, there's other tongues of prayer, and all we'll get into as we get over into Acts. But you've got to understand, I do not have the gift of speaking in tongues. Y'all know that. But a lot of y'all do. Did you have any idea, or have you considered, that when you pray in tongues, the curse or Bible is not hindering you? Because it has been empowered by the Holy Spirit to break through that curse, as shown in Acts chapter 2. I think it's a neat thing. I think it's incredible. And God's called some of you to pray uh, with this gift. But this is talking about a language gift here, but still it's still comparable, and I'll show you as we move on. But this is what was happening. You got this curse of Babel. People are coming from all these different nations, from Galilee, uh, from Asia, well, Turkey, and all these. There was all people there from all over. Matter of fact, there's a verse that uh, tells how many countries they were from. And so they came. The problem is how God used the confusion of languages to distribute or to confound or to scatter people. God gave the gift of tongues to break through the scattering, but brought them all together. So therefore, you can see why the enemy has a gift of tongues. It's such a divisive element of the Spirit in the body of Christ. Can somebody hear what I'm saying? The, the greatest divisive gift is the gift of tongues in the body of Christ. But I submit to you, in Acts chapter 2, it was a gift that God used to bring everybody into unity. Isn't that incredible? To me, it's absolutely incredible. So, I have a deep respect for those of you that have that gift. I have an incredible respect for those that have the gift of praying in tongues and speaking in tongues. I have a, I have a great appreciation for it because that's what God used to bring unity in Acts chapter 2. Amen? But test what I say. God was showing His intervention of the curse of Babel by the invasion of the earth by His Holy Spirit. God used His invasion on earth by the gift of His Holy Spirit. And He showed it by reversing the curse of Babel there on the day of Pentecost. God was giving His new creation the ability to hear Him. Amen. Tongues is about overcoming the curse of Babel. I'm sure some people will have problems with me saying that. But if you study it and look into it like I am, call me and I'll forgive you. <laughs> yeah. Well, it even gets in. But it's still, it's still the point of confusion and unity.
And, I, and I'll show you, I'll bring more definition to this <clears throat> if I can get to it. Now look at Acts 2 6. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded. It was noised abroad. Because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Now I hope you got a better appreciation now of what was happening. Because the curse of Bible, the languages is keeping everybody. But you, you can see here they were confounded because every man heard him speak in his own language. It's like, oh no, all of a sudden this Tower of Bible things. What in the world is going on? Do you not think that that noise would go abroad? You talk about scattering fast. They didn't have iPhones. That thing went nuclear. Nuclear. 24 hours went nuclear. Scattered abroad. Why? Because the power of those tongues was bringing unity. Here we go. It was noised abroad. Noised abroad was from the sounds of the wind. The wind will send out a call. This mighty wind came in. The outpouring of the Spirit, the tongues, it was a wind. It was the wind of the Spirit was carrying it abroad. When the wind of the Spirit hits this place, you don't have to advertise it. The wind of the Spirit carries it abroad. You know when there's little outpourings here and there or whatever, people just figure it out somehow and they end up there. Have you noticed that? This is what's happening here in Acts 2. It's this supernatural phenomena of the wind of the Spirit is truly moving. And it'll just make it, the wind, that, the wind making it noise abroad is an operation of God, not of us. It's an operation of God. God starts drawing people to get immersed in the power of the Spirit. It says a multitude came together. The multitude came together because they heard the call of the wind. See that? This one's not called gone with the wind. This one's called called of the wind. <laughs> and it says here, look, it says here that they were confounded. Confounded because each heard it in their own language. Do you, can, now here's what I want you to see. They were experiencing a supernatural outpouring of the Spirit of God. They were bewildered. They were totally, totally bewildered. But yet they were confounded at the same time. Now I'm going to get a little deeper into that one here in a minute. They were bewildered, but they were also confounded. They're like, what, what, what is this? What meaneth this? Point being, the Holy Spirit will cause us all to hear the same thing, thus creating unity, no matter the different languages of our own hearts. So, they all heard the same thing, we, and you can come in here, and we've got all different kinds of languages of interpretation and everything else. When we all hear the Spirit, we will come into a supernatural unity. And I'll tell you mainly how they unity, you know, if you're if you come to church and you're sitting there thinking, well, if they would only do this, the Spirit of God would be, well, if they'd sing this song, or no, they're not doing that right. If they would just do this, then God would move. Now, don't, don't look at me like nobody's ever thought that. <laughs> There's very few people that come through the doors of the church house that don't think that. If you want to make God move, make God move, that was some statement. If you, want, if you pray for God to move, the element is unity. And if there's going to be unity, that means somebody's going to have to lay something down. You see, it's not a, you can have the greatest idea that's ever been known to man. And you can come in these doors and God's going to ask you to lay it down, keep your mouth shut, and just join unity with the congregation. The, the hardest thing you'll ever do is to hold revelation than it is to give it. It's easy to give it. It's hard to hold it. When you find out the power's in the holding, not the giving. How can that be? 
It's because we lay it down. It's not a sacrifice unless you lay down something you think is very valuable. That's the reason if we all laid down everything, we could call five and six year olds up here and they could prophesy to us. Because we lay down what we think is a greater for a lesser, only to discover the lesser was a greater all the time. Are you with me? It's just the ways of the Spirit. Oh, I just got a few minutes and I. Okay, that's the point being. It's the unity. And so it creates everybody. It, it, it create, when we're in unity, it creates a language of the Spirit. It's not a religious language. Can you hear me? A religious language means when we come in, I think, well, they do this or do that or sing this song or stand up here or sit down there. They play this note. If they just play this song, God would show up. That's a religious spirit. I'm sorry if I hurt your feelings. That's a religious spirit. The Holy Spirit means, I think if we did this, that, but you know what? I'm going to lay it down because I want to come into unity with whatever the Spirit of God wants to do. I don't have a great idea for God. I want God to have the great idea. So the key is we lay down our great ideas. It's not how many great ideas can we broadcast. God doesn't need one more great idea. You don't invoke God with a great idea. He's got the greater idea. But the key is we learn to walk in the Spirit and lay down and sacrifice what we think is incredible. The world needs to know this. God, God says, lay it down. But God, you gave it to me. I sure did. So you'd lay it down. So we learn that it's harder to yield than it is to move. Can you hear that? Now, where do we get to? Acts 2, 7 and 8, and I just got a few minutes. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all of these that speak Galatians? And how hear we every man in his own tongue, wherein we were born, the apostles by means of the Holy Spirit, were able to speak in foreign languages in order to preach and teach the good news of God's kingdom. We see that's what was happening as they move in this gift of tongues. There again, understanding as they were moving in the gift of tongues, and I hope you got this as a takeaway this morning, that the gift of tongues was a reversal of the curse of Babel. Now, in Acts 2, 9 and 11... Now here we go into all of these people and among the dwellers. All of this, this is where everybody was coming from, Asia. That Asia, there's actually Turkey and go on in Egypt, Libya, Kareem, strangers of Rome, Jews, proselytes, Cretes, and the Arabians. We do hear them speak in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. That's a big crowd. That's a, that's a huge crowd. Just those people right there heard the tongues. That's a lot of folks. Now, why does it have all these folks? Because in the previous verse it said that the wind scattered it abroad. So all of these people showed up. The more different tongues showed up is how many different tongues was given. There again, God was making a spectacle out of the Tower of Babel with the gift of tongues. Asia was not the continent Asia referred to. It was a specific providence that we know today as Turkey. The group was speaking of the wonderful works of God. They were praising God. The crowd heard the praises in their own tongue. There is something that happened here, and I won't have to stop. What happened here is this whole group that's above there, they were praising, they were hearing in their own language, they were baffled, totally baffled. They couldn't believe what they were hearing. And they were hearing these wondrous works of God in their own language. So they were baffled on one side. Shoot, I've got one more. Can I, I got two minutes. Give me two minutes. I'm trying to. I, let me give you two more minutes. Uh, that's a different speaking in tongues. We'll get into that uh, later. Um, Okay, they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? 
They were all amazed and what? Now here's what I want you to see. They were all amazed and in doubt at the same time. So when God's poor spirit is poured out, there's part of you that's going to be amazed, and there's another part of you that says, I don't know if that's God or not. You, you're going to have this battle within you. It's normal. Don't get upset about it. Just sort of lean heavy into the amazement side, okay? You just trust me. So it says they were all amazed and they were in doubt. Saying to him, what means this? When God shows up, there is always amazement and doubt. You see that? The two's going to run side by side. Now, if we get enough doubt going on, guess what's going to happen? It's going to win. If we get enough doubt in the room, it's going to shut down an outpouring of God. Everybody has a choice to make. It, don't wait till you're convinced it'll never happen. It's a choice. It's not an intellectual convincing. It's a choice. You're going to be amazed and you're going to be in doubt. It's a choice. There's this little lawyer in us that says, well, I don't know. I've got to say a little more. Well, that person over there is laying on the floor. I think I've seen them twitch. I've got doubt. You, you can come up with all the reasons you want to doubt. The enemy's got a hell full of them. But you see, they were all amazed and they were in doubt. When God shows up, there's always amazement and doubt. Oh, come on, Holy Ghost. Amazement births wonder, and wonder births worship. Now listen to me. The reason you want to stay in amazement and not doubt is because true worship comes through amazement. So when God's moving, part of you's amazed, part of you's in doubt, you got to shift into the amazement. What creates worship is amazement. There's people who believe that God doesn't do miracles today, doesn't move. How in the world can you have true worship? Now watch this, and I'm about done. No wonder, no worship. That's just a fact. No wonder, no worship. You truly worship because you are truly in touch with the wonders of God. That's what happened on the day of Pentecost. They were amazed, but yet they were in doubt. They heard it in their own language, but yet they were in doubt. They were amazed. And as they were amazed and yielded to amazement, it says that they broke out in praise. Can you imagine all those different countries standing out around praising God in their own language? What a mess. What a glorious mess. When your wonder stops, so does your worship. Why does Satan constantly cause the people of God to doubt God's amazing wonders? It's so you don't accomplish true worship. Can you see that? True worship. True worship is what stirs the Holy Spirit is true worship. It's because we're tuned in to truth. And the truth is, I see the amazing hand of God. And because I identify and see this amazing hand of God, it causes me, I am convinced that this amazement, the God who creates this, is worthy of my worship. Amen. Satan's after God's people not to worship him. Have you got it? I'm going to hush. I'm three minutes over. We'll stop right there today. Consider what I've said about the power of the Spirit, the speaking of tongues. I said a lot of good stuff about tongues. Those of y'all that weren't in here, you need to go back and listen to it because I covered it. Let's stand. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you for this day. I ask and pray, Lord, if there's anything that I've said that's not of you, I pray it would fall to the ground. If there's anything that I've said that is of you, 
I pray, O oh God, that it would be quickened to our hearts. We would be in amazement at your word. We'd be in amazement of the things that you have done. Lord, I ask and pray that we would all be in unity in this house. I pray that we would lay down all of our great ideas and we would yield to your great idea. I pray that we would yield to your word. Now, Lord, we declare this morning that we're all here in amazement of what you have done in our lives. Please fill us, O oh God, with true worship, true worshipers, you say you're looking for, true worshipers. Show us and help us to be true worshipers of the Most High God. And the house said, Amen and Amen.